Hi, welcome to Orchard Supply Hardware. Hi, do you stock like 500 different types of shovels? No, only the best ones. And do you have a ginormous store that I need a GPS to get around in? No, as you can see, our store is the perfect size. Okay, then I'm also looking for sales associates who act all surprised when I ask for help. Nope, our people love to help. Wow, are you sure there's a market for this? Orchard Supply Hardware is actually fun to be around. Come see at the happiest grand opening ever, May 20th and 21st at our new Belmont store. Orchard, home, hardware, and happiness. There's something outside. What is that? Radio. Good afternoon, Monster X Radio listeners. This is Gunnar Monson, your host of Monster X Radio, along with my good friend Shane Corson. I am also the founder of the Sasquatch Coffee Company. You can check it out at www.squatchcoffee.com. Sasquatch Coffee. Have you tried it yet? Um, I'm excited about today's show uh, and because uh, I and Shane believe we're dealing with a terrestrial you know, one-dimensional. We're talking about a, an animal. And uh, I think there's a lot of room for improvement in, in the Bigfoot community of how we approach um, the subject and do it in a scientific way. I mean, and who better to ask than an actual scientist? Um, Shane, how are you doing today? I'm doing well, Gunnar. I'm all, uh, like you, I'm also uh, excited to talk with uh uh, you know, not, you know, an actual scientist in, in Todd Pisato, a guy that I admire and I've followed for quite a while that, uh, uh, you know, has taken part, uh, thankfully taken part in some of the uh, the studies um, uh, of, of, of Sasquatch and, uh, you know, is a, is a big figure in the Bigfoot community, even though, um, uh, you know, he, nothing has been proven as of yet uh, for, for Todd to take part and show an interest, you know, a, Coming from a science background and a really um, solid science background, it's, it's, a, it's going to be an honor to talk to Todd today. Yeah, and uh, I said I, most people may know um, Dr. Disatel from the Spike TV show Ten Million Dollar Bigfoot Bounty, where he actually was the guy that, when the contestants, if you are familiar with the concept, I always thought uh, Bigfoot Bounty was kind of like uh, Survivor meets. Uh, uh, finding Bigfoot, and they had these teams, and they went out and uh, uh, had tasks, you know, and they had to go out and bring back evidence or whatever, or pr- what they thought was evidence. And then actually, um, Dr. Dissadel was uh, one of the people that, that processed that evidence, um, and he is uh, an expert in, in uh, DNA analysis. So um, if you didn't see that show, you may not know who he is unless – you know, you're uh, active in the Bigfoot community, and and I actually talk to people that don't even know, which is is uh, kind of a shame um, that that really. anybody in the Bigfoot community wouldn't know who we're talking about. So um, let's get uh, Dr. Disatel on here with us. Good afternoon, Dr. Disatel. Welcome to Monster X Radio. Thanks for having me. You bet. So for um, folks that don't know who you are, can you tell us a little bit about um, what you do and, and who you are? Well, I'm a professor of anthropology, of biological anthropology at New York University in New York City, and I have been running our molecular primatology lab for the last 25 years. In fact, i have just celebrating my 25th anniversary at NYU um, this year. 
So that, to me, makes you preeminently um, qualified to uh, bring in a unique perspective and an actual hard science perspective to the field of Bigfoot. What, what, do you have an interest in Bigfoot? And if so, where did that come from? Well, so as I tell everybody, I'm definitely a skeptic, but as a scientist, I can't say it absolutely does not exist. And my interest comes because over the years in my laboratory, uh, my students and I and other researchers in my lab have actually helped identify multiple new species and subspecies of primates. So there are unknown primates out there. They have been found in the last 20 years, and my lab has been involved in a lot of that research. So the, the very same tools that we use to identify, you know, a new subspecies of chimpanzee or gorilla or a new species of um, African forest monkey, in theory, could be applied to basically any animal. Um, and I was approached uh, a long time ago um, to assist on the show uh, Monster Quest, um, on a show that Jeff Meldrum um, was doing, and asked if I could do DNA analyses from hair. Um, and that's how, in fact, we actually identified some of these other um, real species of primates, as my lab has been involved in extracting DNA out of hair and out of feces and other samples, um, you know, for over 20 years now. It's 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 a uh, fascinating work you do, Todd. How uh, how did you become the the kind of the go-to guy? I, I guess uh, I know you get sent, uh, unfortunately, a lot of different things, uh, and I know you're a very busy guy. But was it because of that show that people decided to make you the go-to guy to send stuff to? Well, I was one of the very few uh, real academics who once said yes. <laughs> And basically, <laughs> once you say yes, and also I think a lot of it has to do with being in New York City, which is a major media market, a lot of production companies, I'm kind of close by and easy to um, talk to. Um, and so, you know, I, I try to limit it. I try to only do, you know, as credible or at least semi-credible of things as possible. I don't just take things from the public um, because one of my main goals is actually science education. And so if I can go on a show, even if it has what some people would say is a strange premise, but I get to talk about DNA analyses, evolution, scientific methods, skepticism, and those things, um, I think that's a very important thing to do. Now, you, 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 you say you don't get, uh, you don't usually take, you know, citizen, you know, average citizen, uh, you know, they may send you something. Do you get a lot of stuff from the public in general? Uh, yeah, that, I that, mean, but I don't use, I mean, I don't analyze it. I'm just, right. I can't and you know it it costs money it costs time it costs effort and if i just did everything that was sent me i mean i basically have a, a special freezer <laughs> where everything just gets <laughs> dumped into and about once a year we clean it out um but i never encourage any i mean i get tons of emails like can i send you this and they'll send me a picture of a hair they found stuck on a fence you know, I'll, I'll send you this, and maybe I can get the $10 million. I'm like, no, this is not how it works. You know? <laughs> I mean, I get what? that stuff all the I probably get five contacts a month um, via email. I, I literally do not answer my office phone <laughs> unless I actually see that it's somebody I'm expecting a call from. Um, because every now and then it's somebody who can find me on the Internet because, you know, I'm a university professor and our numbers listed and stuff like that. Right. So, and I also keep a zip code map there or an area code map. There are certain area codes I never answer the phone from, and you can guess where those are. <laughs> 
So I'm sorry if you're trying to call me from like Wyoming or Montana. Um, it's unlikely I'm going to answer the phone. <laughs> I mean, I, you got to by by accepting saying yes once. It sounds like you may have opened up opened up the proverbial Bigfoot's Pandora's box. Um, yeah, I mean, I've done so. I've not not everything I've done on TV has been Bigfoot related, but I've done. I think by last count, not counting actual news interviews, something like 32 different episodes of different TV shows. I'm actually right. on IMDb, which shocks me. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're, you're uh, Dr. Distel, you're hot, off, obviously highly sought after when it comes to um, uh, being, being an academic involved with cryptozoology uh, in general. You're obviously highly, highly sought after. Uh, what has been your experience, though, with uh, double double question here with the TV aspect? It, aspect, you know, shows like Monster Quest and and the. the uh, what are what are your thoughts of the Bigfoot uh, quote uh, community? Uh, what has your, been your um, your experience? Well, so I've met a lot of really interesting characters. I mean, that's like the biggest understatement possible. Um, <laughs> And, I mean, to me, I I kind of divide the Bigfoot community into sort of three um, pieces. There are just the absolute hucksters and fraudsters and jerks. Um, there are the sort of people who are really serious about it and actually trying to do good science and, you know, going out there with camera traps and, you know, sample collection kits and doing it properly. Um, and then there's, you know, another third of it is just sort of, you know, the, the weekend warrior interest kind of. They watch a show if it's on TV. They've gone to uh, one of the conferences somewhere. They've joined one of the Bigfoot research or organizations in the various states. Um, but they're not they're not well equipped for it. Um, you know, they're they're sort of the, the real amateurs. But I won't call the ones who are serious about it necessarily true professionals. When somebody says they are a professional Bigfoot researcher, um, that kind of raises my uh, uh, level of uh, disbelief a little bit. Well, there really isn't any professional Bigfoot researcher. Because well, so that would a be... lot of people call themselves that. They call themselves right. Bigfoot experts, and I'm like, you yeah. guys have yet to supply one data point. <laughs> so there is no that... such thing as an expert in that yet. There could be someday, right. but, right. you know, you might be an expert mammologist. You might be, right. you know, an expert whatever, but you're not an expert on Bigfoot. Because we don't even have it even proven that Bigfoot exists. Right. And, you know, they're like, <laughs> yeah. well, but I've read all of the literature. Uh, well, you yeah. know, I've read Game of Thrones, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yes, okay. But that's a good point. I mean, that's a valid point, is it? It's important if you're going to present yourself as this or that that uh, you're, you have um, something to actually back it up. I mean, right. really, in, in, the fee, in Bigfoot team, the, the closest thing that I see as an expert in Bigfoot is someone who's had a, a sighting. I mean, that would be as much of an expert, basically, as we've got. Um, yeah, if it is a, you know, Real it has to sighting. be a recorded sighting, though. You know, yeah. eyewitness testimony is, you know, it's even being used by the police in the courts less and less. The more we understand eyewitness testimony, um, the less we're actually using it in this country. And, you know, beyond the blurry photos and videos and stuff, just saying <laughs> you saw one um, doesn't right. really make you an expert. I mean, because, again, maybe you saw something else. And in your mind, you thought it was a Bigfoot, and over the years and decades, you truly, truly come to believe it. 
um, because, you know, we do have all of the psychological reinforcing mechanisms and stuff like that. Um, you know, I, I have watched people come in with a vague account and by a week later it's rock solid down to, you know, details when their initial account was incredibly vague and shadowy. Yeah, it, 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 and, that, and that does happen uh, more times than not, un, unfortunately, but it's it's a true point. Uh, uh, now, now, Dr. Distel, um say you get a sample, and it's a sample from a peer or, uh, you know, it's been scientifically collected and it, it's not just from a, your average uh, citizen out there with no background right. or academic background. You get a, you get a, a sample of something. What is um, – can you explain what you do exactly in the process? Well, so the very first step is we have to extract the DNA. And so and then so let me explain sort of what we typically do versus what one could theoretically do. Um what you can theoretically do is much more involved and way more expensive, but what we do to date is basically we extract DNA, which it depends on what the source is. Um if it's uh, a hair, um, we need to basically digest the hair to get rid of the coating, to get rid of the proteins. If it's uh, feces, we need to break that down and break open all of the cells in the feces. If it's blood or saliva, it's a relatively similar step. And ultimately is what we end up with is basically a soup of you know liquid with whatever the original sample has been broken down so all of the cells in the original sample are broken open um, we eat up the proteins with enzymes dna is not a protein so you can digest all of the proteins in the sample away and then um, using a combination of other uh, chemicals or reagents, we actually separate the DNA from the rest of the cellular debris. So now I just have a test tube full of just DNA. But depending on what the sample is, it could be like, for instance, if it's feces, I have all of the DNA in the feces, the bacteria, the plants and animals, the thing ate, as well as the organism that left it behind. Um, but our next step then is to carry out a procedure we call the polymerase chain reaction, or PCR, in which using known information about the genome, we actually um, try to fish out a piece of the genome and we synthetically make billions of copies of it. Um, so I generally, we start with the mitochondrial genome, the maternally inherited portion of our genome, because there's hundreds to a thousand times more mitochondrial DNA in every cell than there is in the nucleus. And so if you only have trace amounts, we start with the most common thing. So we basically sequence a chunk of the mitochondrial genome. And this is what's now also used for something called DNA barcoding to help build the tree of life. And so we have lots of data about the mitochondrial genome. And nine times out of 10, you get a direct or almost direct match after we sequence that amplified DNA to something that's already known in the database. So basically, I get the sequence off my um, automated DNA sequencer, and I run that sequence against the database, and it tells me exactly what it is or something very close to it. So it might not say, you know, canis lupus for wolf, but it will say it's a canid, and so I'll know it's something dog-like. Um, if it's something that doesn't match anything in the database, we do an evolutionary analysis of it against other info from the database and find out where in the tree of life it falls. You know, if it turns out that it's, you know, frog DNA, it's not Bigfoot, right? <laughs> um, but Well, that depends it, on who you ask. Well, <laughs> true. <laughs> 
So we basically write, we operate under the general assumption that it's primate. And my basic search is, is it fall within the range of variation of a known primate, or is it a new primate? And if it's a new primate, what kind of primate is it? You know, is it a monkey? Is it a lemur? Is it an ape? Does it fall close to the human lineage? And these would tell us, you know, for instance, there are people who theorize. And again, this is theory. There's no data. They theorize that it's a remnant, long-surviving um, member of the group Gigantopithecus. So that's a, fo a real fossil that lived in Asia for several million years, the most recent fossil of which is two to 300,000 years old. So some people say, well, Gigantopithecus, it's gigantic. Bigfoot and Yeti are gigantic, therefore Bigfoot must be Gigantopithecus. Other people think it might be a relic or remnant Neanderthal, or their close cousins, the Denisovans. Um, which have only recently um, been discovered in the last seven years. And so if I do an evolutionary analysis, Gigantopithecus is thought to be a relative of the orangutans. Clearly Neanderthals and Denisovans are our relatives, so that sequence, if it's not in the database, would fall on the branch with either orangutans or the branch with humans or some other branch. And so even if it's a complete unknown, we can still sort of place it in its general proximity. But nine times out of ten, it's a bear or a dog. <laughs> right. <laughs> do, you, do you currently have anything in your, your data bank or your collection that is unknown at this point or doesn't match um, anything uh, that has been documented by science as of yet? Whether I've never had that happen in 25 years. Yeah. I mean, well, again, except for the case of the new species and subspecies of real primates. Mm -hmm. But in that case, they fell on branches close to things that were known. And that's, for instance, why there are subspecies of chimp and a subspecies of gorilla. So they mm -hmm. fell within the range of gorillas and within the range of chimps, but their population was was significantly different enough from known populations to make it an actual subspecies. Hmm. The last monkey that was uh, described from our lab um, basically fell within a group of known monkeys, but it fell outside the range of any of the known species within that monkey, so it was placed into its own species rather than subspecies. And we can compare different species and subspecies to each other to say these guys are different enough that if we think these two things are subspecies and our new thing is even more different, then it's at least a subspecies or it's at least a species. But I've, I've never had one of the so-called cryptid samples not – I've had many fail – because the, there just wasn't DNA in the sample. It wasn't preserved well enough. I've had some that were too heavily contaminated to tell what it is, um, but I've never had, like, here is a unique DNA sequence I have never seen before. I, in hundreds and hundreds of samples, I have never seen that. And, and that brings up another point about contamination. Uh, it is... Uh, I would imagine so easy to contaminate a, a sample. It's probably uh, happens uh, once again more times than not. Yeah. Again, especially when you have, you know, for want of a better term, amateurs. You know, oh, there's a hair on this tree. I'm going to put it in my pocket when I get home. I'll put it in a Ziploc bag. You know, but that you touching it, you having it in your pocket and stuff. You know, unless you collect it under absolutely sterile conditions. And you have to be careful. If you even breathe on it, you could actually deposit your own DNA on it. Um, 
So, I mean, one of the things on the show on the $10 million Bigfoot Bounty is, you know, we gave lessons how to collect it. I basically said, I am not even going to look at your sample unless you take a photograph and get GPS coordinates before you even pick it up. And then your partner has to film you picking it up, wearing gloves, wearing a mask, using a sterile tweezers, putting it into a sterile tube, or I'm not even going to analyze it. And so, you know, they were forced to go around, you know, with backpacks full of stuff to properly collect stuff. This is what my grad students do all the time when they're in the field. We have uh, one young woman's in the field right now in um, Zambia in southern Africa, and she's got, you know, tons of gloves and masks and tubes to collect samples there. Um, But when you just go out and pick it up, you know, you're most likely going to contaminate it. Sometimes we can decontaminate things. Hair, we often can decontaminate them, but not always. Um, But if it's too heavily contaminated, you get a very mixed signature, and it's really difficult, if not impossible, to, like, tease out what the real signature is because you have overlapping signals you know at 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 one mm-hmm. position you might have two or three different um dna bases and then the next position you have two and the next one you have two if you think of the combinatorial thing of trying to figure out everything it could be you you can't do it yeah and, um dr Distel, did you have any uh, did you work on the uh, the discovery of the Billy Ape at all? Were you involved with that uh, process whatsoever? Which one? The Billy Ape, sorry. I was given some samples that were purported to be from that. Um, and I'm trying to remember now. That was a long time ago. Mm, I, yeah. I think they just turned out to be chimp. So, yeah, there was a big to-do made about it. You know, it had big footprints Mm -hmm. and stuff like that. But um, the sample we sequenced was chimp. Now, the question is, you know, what did they collect? You know, when you just have some stray hairs, um, you have a footprint and you have some stray hairs in a region where chimps and gorillas live, you know, why is that from (laughs) it necessarily? Right. And I had it, people who swore up and down that they had seen it. And, I mean, I even had somebody tell me that these hairs were clearly not chimpanzee, um, you know, that they looked like um, a male silverback's hair, except they were chimp, not gorilla. <laughs> Which brings me to a point that hair is not easy. If somebody just has a hair and they tell you they take it to a hair expert, hair is a really poor biomaterial. Um, First of all, think of your own body or your dogs or something. The hair all over the body varies and differs. There's not a universal hair type on a deer you know, or on your dog or on yourself. Um, And people who claim that they can, you know, identify species on hair um, often can't. And, in fact, a major report by the National Academy of Sciences has really been attacking the forensic analyses of hair used by police departments all over the country. And so a lot of people are dropping hair analyses. Um, because if you're trying to match an individual, like here we have a wool hat and it's got a couple of hairs in it and here's our suspect, you might be able to do that, but an unknown hair in the woods to claim what it is is very difficult, if not impossible. Very, very, uh, very interesting stuff. Uh, in regards to... Uh, DNA. Is there any new technology in the DNA processing uh, that's uh, coming to light now or something new that you've been working on? 
Well, so um, doing um, basically uh, what you can either call it, well, second or next generation DNA analyses, the ways that you can now sequence entire genomes from very small sources. So, for instance, you know, we've sequenced the entire Neanderthal genome um, twice now. Um, we've sequenced the Denisovan genome from a tiny little fragment. Um, so that's possible. It's also much, much more expensive. You know, you're in the thousands of sample instead of the um, hundreds of sample. Um, and you sequence so much DNA, you actually don't have to worry about contamination because even if you only have one-tenth of one percent of your purported beastie, um, when you sequence a hundred billion bases of DNA, one-tenth of one percent still gives you millions of bases of DNA. So um, literally on Thursday, a paper came out in the scientific journal Science in which they actually sequenced the dirt from the floors of, let me look up exactly how many, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight caves in Europe and in Siberia. And they actually identified Denisovan DNA, dinosaur DNA, woolly rhinoceros, mammoth, cave bears, things that have been extinct for tens of thousands of years. And these samples were anywhere from like 40 to 100,000 years old. And literally just the dirt from the cave. Because an animal living in the environment, when they pee, salivate, defecate, even if they die and their body completely disintegrates, they're leaving behind DNA in the environment. And these new techniques are so sensitive that just a single fragment of DNA, you can actually get sequence out of it. So I'm working actually with high school kids over the summer, and we go to Central Park and Washington Square Park, and we dig up little vials of soil, and then we sequence all of the DNA in it. Most of it's bacteria, fungi, insects, but you get dogs and rats and people and pigeons and hawks and whatever, squirrels, whatever is in that area is leaving DNA behind. So this okay, is that's, the really that's exciting that's thing. So this yeah, is huge. That's, so that's, that's I am hoping forward, in the next few years to actually get, you know, the, the proper levels of funding to actually sample some of the most famous areas and we'll be able to identify every animal in that forest. That is, uh, I've done a little bit of study on this, and I did read that article that you had mentioned in the science thing. I was going to ask you, is this what they, they refer to as Terra, terra genome? Well, we, I, it's generally referred to as environmental DNA or eDNA. Okay. So, so you may have heard of uh, studies like, you know, swiping New York City subways and handrails and ATM you know, screens and detecting all of the different gross things that are there. <laughs> I mean, this is the same thing writ large in, in the forest or in a pond. You can do a pond or a river, and you can identify every fish, every insect, every snail, every clam in that body of water by just literally sequencing all of the DNA from a liter of water from that thing. And so this is huge. This is, I, I think this is going to be the future. The problem is this isn't just putting on a backpack, grabbing your camera and going out for, you know, a weekend. This is going to require serious scientific effort and some serious funding behind it because to do any one of those samples is actually, the cost is coming down dramatically, but it's still hundreds or even thousands compared to the dozens or hundreds of dollars. 
But this is going to replace all of the other stuff, I think. That's so unless amazing. it's an interdimensional, time-shifting, you know, whatever, <laughs> it's going should to be still be leaving. able to get DNA. It, yeah, if it's, if it's an <laughs> organism, it still should shed right. DNA, if yeah. it has DNA. <clears throat> What are the uh, hmm, what are the deal. possibilities though with with this sort of I mean what are the the possibilities that this this is really for me some of the most amazing uh, stuff I've heard of in a while when it comes to the study of DNA. Uh, it's well, I mean, it, I'm it, sure in a lot of ways it, it's groundbreaking. It's breaking open conservation biology, uh, biodiversity studies. I mean, in the past, if we found <clears throat> if we got access to a new forest fragment in Africa. We'd have to send a grad student or somebody for like a year or two to just observe everything to try to figure out what's even there. Now we can zoom in and get samples and we can do a dozen forced fragments or whatever environment we want to see what's there. And then we can focus on the ones that are the most promising. It's like this one has the greatest diversity of monkeys, so we're going to study this one rather than this one that didn't have any monkeys in it in our initial screening. And the, uh, the well, the possibilities are, are, are just amazing to me. I'm, um, you know, what, obviously, you're not going to want, uh, <laughs> like you ever did, but you're not going to want, uh, just because this is groundbreaking stuff, you and it's expensive process. You're not going to want people sending you a ton of stuff. But oh, I'm going to, I'm going to, after this show, I'm going to get dirt in the mail by Wednesday. <laughs> I've got some dirt in my backyard. I want to see what's in. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. I'm, sh- I'm pretty sure that uh, one of the questions that pops into my head is like, so in theory, I have a Bigfoot sighting, a visual sighting, and yeah. this Bigfoot leaves a a clear footprint. Could yeah. you, I mean, is this, does this technology allow you to pull, it let, I'm assuming it would leave DNA behind if it stepped somewhere? In theory, that would be not be much. <laughs> I yeah, mean, okay. right. it's, you know, so think of when you grab your coffee cup there, mm-hmm. you're leaving an actual fingerprint. What is that fingerprint? Well, it's oils and other secretions Oil. with a few cells. So if if you're only leaving a few cells in that big footprint, it's probably not going to work. But if you saw it defecate there or, you know, you knew one died in this spot, the body's been scavenged, but it was literally lying there before all the things ate it and took it away, There'll be Mm -hmm. DNA there, but just from a single footprint, I doubt it. And another thing, so I've already said hair isn't, hair alone without DNA out of it isn't great. Uh, It's way better than footprints. (laughs) I mean, (laughs) footprints are, I think, one of the weakest possible pieces of data. And, you know, I I respect Jeff Meldrum. In fact, I literally was speaking to him last week at a conference. We had a long chat together. Um, Mm -hmm. And Jeff and I get along. I have defended him against some of his detractors. But footprints alone are not going to lead you to a new species. They can tell you about a known species. So we have a lot mm-hmm. of fossil footprints now from Neanderthals and Australopithecines and stuff like that. And we've actually learned some really cool things in the last few years from the patterns of those footprints. But you're not going to identify, positively identify a new organism from its footprints. No way. And all the cats and that- in the world are not going to convince anybody and footprints are probably the singular easiest thing to either outright hoax or have somebody hoaxing you. You know, I, I, I guarantee you whenever one of these groups goes out to an area and the local teenagers in town hear that there's Bigfoot hunters out there, 
I would be out there hooping and hollering at night and knocking on logs and wearing fake footprints, wouldn't you? <laughs> well, you're <laughs> I mean, on now, now, now that I'm in my 50s, <laughs> I probably wouldn't do that. Yeah. <laughs> but, you know, when I was younger, if I knew there was a Bigfoot research group in the area, definitely would be out there just for fun. You so, know. so if somebody in – so we have people that claim to have regular contact or to know, I, I guess, for lack of a better term, they are referred to as habituators. Yeah. So folks that, yeah, that know that, you know, I've had many people, oh, yeah, you know, I'll, I can take you right to where they're at. And i like, well, but, but there's always a lack of evidence. Bring me the, a high-resolution video of the encounter. Right. Yeah, I mean, it, and even you, that, again, even it, pictures and video aren't great. Um, right. There's been plenty of hoaxes on that, and CGI is pretty. I just saw Kong; it was pretty cool. <laughs> yeah. No, and that's um, so, but if you had an area that that somebody claimed that well, we could say the the Erickson project, if if there was a frequent and it could be documented that. They're, they were in the area, so you could find an area that they um, were in and out of. Supposedly in the Kentucky, they had you know them eating pancakes off this this gal's porch. Yeah. So in theory, you could if the, it was an area that was frequented, you'd have a better chance of. I get the single footprint walking through the forest is not probably going to produce much DNA, but uh, um, um, in fact, um, the Olympic project has. Uh, an area that has some unusual ground structures. Um, yeah. In, and I, I don't. Are you familiar with the? Is with that, that the Soho or whatever they call it? Pro- no, no, that. Uh, that. Yeah. That would be somebody else. The Olympic okay. Project is up in Washington and and found okay. so, several um, structures on the ground that l- look very much like. Um, what what great apes make, or what gorillas you make in uh, yeah. Africa? Yes. And um, and I know that Shane actually Shane, you would could speak to this better. You've actually been to the site of of the, the yeah. nest, for lack of a better word. They look like giant bird nests. Yeah. Yeah. No. I, I mean, I'm I'm roughly familiar with that stuff we actually when mm-hmm. we were filming bigfoot bounty we came across several places where animals clearly had laid down at night you know some of the guys were calling them nests um but i you know was skeptical um but something clearly knocked down some of the bushes and the grass was flattened but a lot of animals do that <laughs> You know, and so to to make that connection, um, that's where, you know, the thing I would do would be scour really, really, really carefully from hair from there. Um, you know, that's the most likely thing. In fact, um, one of a uh, former grad student of mine, he worked on gorillas in um, Nigeria this cross river gorilla this is one of these new um subspecies they're the most highly endangered of all of them they're extremely rare only a few hundred of them and for the first few years we didn't even have well we had one photo and it actually looked like a bigfoot photo this gorilla running off you know back towards them 50 meters away running into the forest blurry <laughs> um but we had their dna because these guys made nests, slept at night, and gorillas, if you know, they eat what we call terrestrial herbaceous vegetation. They have the highest fiber diet in the world, and they're awesome. They get up in the morning from their nest, they take about two steps and take a dump, and then they walk off for the rest of the day looking for more food to eat. (laughs) So you almost inevitably find feces near the nest, and you definitely find hair in the nest. You know, if they're lying there at night moving around just a little bit, they're shedding hair. Um, so if you had something like that, 
you know, again, where's the evidence? Just showing mm-hmm. a, uh, you know, taking a picture of, look, look, something slept here. You know, the forest is full of deer and elk and bear and bobcat and, you know, uh, well, yeah, the, more than part, that. Part, part of the problem in that I see in Bigfooting is that, first of all, people um, don't use a process where um, the burden of evidence or bur- burden of proof is on on someone who's trying to prove a, an uh, right. undocumented species. And right. it isn't – it. and saying, I, you know, that big, that this is Bigfoot and that is Bigfoot, that, that that is not scientific at all, let alone saying that, you know, um, uh, making any definitive statement about, about a, a species that isn't proven is – is less than scientific, and it and it right. it does more damage than it does good to uh, the subject, in my opinion. So, so that's where that's where science training and skepticism comes in, because what right. scientists do, we don't prove anything. We we disprove as much as we can, <laughs> but we never prove anything really. So we test and say, that's not it, that's not it, that's not it. Sometimes we're left with just a few things it might be. But, usually, you know, we're ruling things out. We're, we're testing things and saying, it's not this, it's not this. We're rarely, if ever, saying, it is this. And the, my favorite analogy, and it's not even mine, it's like, you know, if you're walking down the street in New York City and you hear hoofbeats, don't turn around looking for a zebra, <laughs> you know. Or a unicorn. <laughs> if you're in the Serengeti and you hear hoofbeats, yeah, turn around. It might be a zebra. <laughs> but a <laughs> sound in the woods, a howl, a turd, a hare, is a Bigfoot. Even if you're in Willow yeah. Creek, California, it's not necessarily Bigfoot. Well, no, the, that, burden, the burden is to eliminate, like you say, eliminate all other knowns before you can. Right. And, and that's so gonna, what, what the, could it be? Could it be a right. bear? Uh, could it be a deer? Could it be an elk? Could it be a bobcat? Could it be a mountain lion? Could it be a domestic dog? Could it be a horse or a cow off the farm? And, you know, those are by far the most likely things. You know, and that's why actually I've I've watched one episode of I for, is it Finding Bigfoot with you know it's yes. like they hear a sound in the distance and they're all you know oh, oh, what was that that was you know it's like Jesus Christ what you know there's a million things that go bump in the night yeah <laughs> yeah well that, it, it is entertainment right so uh, yeah. Um, and so, you know, I actually, so a lot of people, you know, they ask, why do you do this? And as I said, my goal is education. But if education is also entertaining, it's actually more effective. So that's why, for instance, my friend and colleague Natalia Reagan and I have a YouTube series, you know, Talking Science with Dr. Todd and Natalia. We renamed it to get a little more PG-13 from its initial title. Um, but, you know, and what we was have... That? Uh, hmm? So we have a title? YouTube series called Talking Science with Dr. Todd and Natalia. And, what was it know, initially called? Uh, it was called Talking Shit with Dr. Todd and Natalia. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. I like that. Yeah. <laughs> well, but we wanted to let like high school and middle school teachers be able to use it. <laughs> and so yeah. we break down, you know, simple concepts, you know, bipedalism, uh tooth structure, primate diet, you know, those kind of things into three or four minute little funny, you know, comedy, you know, sketches almost but with information and data in them. I always tell people, you know, if you can trick your students into learning, it's far more effective than trying to figure out how to get them to learn. If they always if they remember something years later because of something funny or weird you did in class, you won. 
And so, you know, these shows are that. And they have way bigger audiences than my 40 or 120 student class. So theoretically speaking, uh, Dr. Ditto, if you got a an unknown, a sample that came back and it was, it was very uh, suspicious, what would be the next step? Well, so I have other call. I would send subsamples to other colleagues. I wouldn't tell them what they were, but I have lots of friends and colleagues who will sequence a sample for me. Um, you know, I'm, I would basically send it off to have it validated and verified. I mean, that's what science is all about. We could have made an error in my lab. We could have accidentally contaminated it with orangutan DNA in my lab. So if I get something that looks orangutan-like, I would definitely send, you know, part of the sample out to somebody else to, uh, can you back this up? Um, so, you know, verificate, validation and verification are the, the very next steps. And then if it was really still, you know, if I thought I found the big guy, it would go to peer review for review. I, it's not going to be a press conference. I would definitely write it up and have other people look at it. Yeah, it wouldn't be an overnight thing. It, it, it'd be a, quite the process, you know, using the scientific method, obviously. <laughs> right. It, it would take months, you yeah. know, if not a year um, before anything happened. Because there's been some pretty poor science done recently where, you know, yeah. science by press release is mm-hmm. the worst possible way um, to do it. I mean, Mm -hmm. what typically happens is it leaks out from a conference or a talk or something. Or Facebook. uh, Yeah, yeah, or Facebook, right. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, I wouldn't be tweeting it. (laughs) Dr. Distel, where do you see the the subject of Bigfoot, the research aspect? Where do you see it going? I mean, uh, obviously we're talking about uh, something not proven in science, the unknown. but where do you see that going, and where, where would you like to see, uh, you know, as citizen scientists and, and whatnot, what advice do you have for them? Well, again, learn about the scientific method, but properly, not from a Bigfoot website or wherever. <laughs> um, hopefully take a science class in school, um, read some real science, you know, go to some of the better popular science stuff, you know, you know, the writings of Neil deGrasse Tyson, you know, watch Cosmos or uh, read Neil Shubin's Your Inner Fish, you know, those kinds of things. Learn about real science. And also, one of the things that frustrates me so much, in fact, I've literally bought um, a three-foot-tall human skeleton replica, you know, so a a miniaturized human skeleton and gave it to a friend who's a big Bigfooter because every bone he found in the forest, he's like, oh, is this a Bigfoot hand? It's like, no, you know, you got to learn your anatomy too. (laughs) You know, so, you know, learn about primate behavior. Read Jane Goodall, read Baruti Goldalkis, you know, read Gorillas in the Mist, you know, find out about real um, behavior of real primates. Um, Read the literature on what are primates, what primates are known, what do they look like, how do they act, what do they do out there, what do they eat. you know, there's, I mean, I'm, my entire field, this is what we do. There's hundreds of books published and thousands of articles um, published about this stuff. But also, like we had mentioned earlier, be skeptical. You know, every noise in the woods, every bone on the forest floor, what's the most likely thing? Pick it up and, you know, Go to your local natural history museum. Many of them have days where it's Ask a Scientist Day. You can bring a bone and, oh, that's a metapodial from a deer. You know, that's a deer foot bone. (laughs) 
um, not a Bigfoot arm. So, yeah, but if I found it, so if I had a, and that's the approach that I, I borrowed from a friend in the Bigfooting field a while ago is the approach to um, quote unquote evidence is Bigfoot last because that is, right. like you say, the most likely thing that that it is is uh, a known animal. Right. And, and we we actually have a, a group that goes out in a particular area, and, and and the easiest thing to gather, the most uh, uh, passive w- way to collect um, data is is audio. But audio is also the the most open to interpretation, and right. and you know you can um, best case scenario you get stuff that you actually process through you know against a, a database of known animals and come up with things that are interesting. And yeah. we have some stuff that is interesting, but it's, again, that in itself is not going to to prove an unknown species. I mean, if you think of it, you know, to, to, to you know, if, if you have unique audio, mm-hmm. um, it's not going to identify something if it's unique. Right. <laughs> it's not been yet recorded is the best interpretation of that. Right. Not I mean, you, that you, it's a you're new just species. as likely to to be recording an unknown um, audio that vocalization that a known animal makes that, right. than yeah. you are to be recording. Think yeah. of the noises you make. Every now and then, you make a unique one. You yeah. know, you stub your toe. That <laughs> might be a unique <laughs> noise you have never made before. A new combination of words you have never used before. And imagine and how many animals of their toes out in the forest. Right. So on a scale of one to ten, what where do you place your um, thinking of? Because uh, belief has nothing to do with it any more than belief has anything to do with knowing. You know, there is either is a uh, unknown bipedal animal out there, uh, or there's not. So me believing in it doesn't really have anything to do with right. it any more than believing in my dog has anything to do with whether or not they exist. But right. on a scientific, what percentage of likelihood do you place on the existence of of a Bigfoot creature? So the, the, the trite line I usually use, it's mm-hmm. not zero, but it's adjacent to it. Um, And the reason, so uh, something we haven't brought up yet is Mm -hmm. if there is this cryptid animal out there in the forest, it's not one or two or ten. I mean, a population population. cannot survive at those levels. There has to be hundreds, if not the low thousands of these things out there. It can't be a dozen of them that have survived for 300,000 years or for 40,000 years or for a century. It can't be. I mean, population viability analyses show these over and over again. And so that's why I say with the technologies that we have today, the number of people actually seriously out there looking the fact that almost every human in this country has a camera on them, um, and we still do not have one single credible data point. Tens of thousands of hunters, um, not one credible data point, um, puts it small. Because <laughs> there has to well, be Dr. a lot this of this. I. We are running up against the clock. It's been one of the fastest uh, hours that I've, I've enjoyed doing on Monster X, and we really appreciate you being with us today. Um, we'd love to have and, you back on because I think we could easily talk another hour about the scientific And I appreciate the, the excellent questions. You guys actually nailed many of the key issues um, very succinctly, so I appreciate that. Sometimes this just goes rambling. <laughs> Yeah, well, and the idea is this. What, so if you're listening and, and you are um, interested in Bigfoot research or you consider yourself a Bigfoot researcher, um, 
the idea is to actually go out and and conduct learn how to conduct scientific research. You cannot, you know, pulling up a camp chair and sitting in camp drinking beer and and listening to the woods is not big, is not actual scientific research. Uh, and if and the approach of of Bigfoot last that you have the the obligation on someone who is trying to prove a undocumented species is to eliminate all other possibilities of known species first. So uh, think about that when you go out there and and uh, are looking and collecting quote unquote evidence. That uh, that's only one step of of this process. Uh, I like really appreciate Dr. Disatel joining us today and. Uh, for my friend Shane Porson, we are out of time for Monster X this week, and we will be back next Sunday. Be sure and go and check out our new website at www.monsterxradio.com. Um, this episode will be up there shortly. So uh, thanks, everybody, for listening, and uh, have a great week, and Squatch On. Okay, Mr. Orchard Supply Hardware. Uh-huh. Does Orchard have brands? Of course. Do you have Benjamin Moore? Yes. Craftsman? Mm-hmm. Weber? Yep. Kohler? Absolutely. Okay, how about Spiny Beetle? Spiny Beetle? It's Plumber's Putty from Tasmania. No, sorry. That I totally made up. Orchard Supply Hardware has the brands you and your home need. Come see at the happiest grand opening ever, May 20th and 21st, at our new Belmont store. Orchard, home, hardware, and happiness.